You see that? Steam. Steam rising from the first cup of coffee of the weekend. Here it is. Ever so faintly you can see it, along with my reflection <laughs> in the first cup of coffee of the weekend. I don't know what it is about the first sip of the first cup of coffee of the weekend. We've talked about it before here. I guess it's seared into my retina from years of reading John D. McDonald and Travis McGee. McGee uh, was obsessed with the first sip of gin every Saturday evening. He, uh, he liked Plymouth, very dry, very cold Plymouth gin, and he would pour it into a, a Tom Collins glass, one of those tall glasses. He'd fill it with ice first and then put a little sherry in, and then he'd dump the sherry out, leaving only the coated cubes over which he poured the freezing gin. The cubes would, would crack, and the lingering sherry would react in some delightful way with the juniper, and on and on McGee would go. But his point was, you only get the first sip once. Same thing with coffee. You only get the first sip once. It is a consummation, devoutly to be wished. It was very good. Anyways, the way I heard it, apologies for the late start. I slept in. I haven't slept in in a couple of weeks. Been on the road for the last 14 days. Now I'm back to where the mail comes. And uh, I've pulled this story from the archives because earlier uh, this week I posted an answer to a question on the wall from a woman named Donna who asked in a somewhat accusatory fashion why it was I had never joined the United States Armed Forces. Uh, and I answered her candidly, as I often do. And I went to bed, as I am prone to do. And I awaken the next morning, as I am wont to do, and check the Facebooks and bang, four million people. Four million people had uh, been reached by our little exchange and the resulting conversation was fascinating. Touched on the importance of service, enlisting, and volunteering versus the draft, and many people with many opinions. You just never know what's going to stimulate a conversation. Maybe this will as well. It's called the American Rock Star, and uh, it touches on a lot of those uh, same things. So I'm going to read it to you right now. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and have a sip number two just because, because I can. Wow, I take it back. That was better than the first one. <clears throat> Have you subscribed yet to the way I heard it? I'm duty-bound to ask you to. Micro.com slash podcast. Hit the subscribe button. I don't care if you listen to it on iTunes or Stitcher or Google or none of them. You can watch them right here on Facebook. But if you don't hit subscribe, nobody knows you exist. And if nobody knows you exist, well, that's no way to go through life. The toilet had never done anything to Jason. But Jason was nevertheless determined to blow the toilet to pieces. His reasons were those of a moody kid plagued with enough teenage angst to fill the entire state of Washington. So, Jason lit the fuse of the M-80, dropped it into the bowl, closed the lid, and walked out of the restroom. A minute later, a deafening roar echoed through the hallways of his junior high school, and the toilet was no more. Today, a stunt like that would land Jason in jail. Luckily, this was the early 80s, and the principal decided on a week's suspension instead. Luckier still was his grandmother's decision to make Jason talk to a counselor. And luckiest of all were the presence of several guitars in the counselor's office. Jason was immediately taken with the instrument, and the counselor invited him to pick it up and start strumming. Before long, the two were jamming for most of their scheduled session, launching what his grandmother would later call the most expensive guitar lessons in the world. By the time he finished high school, Jason still had plenty of angst, but he also had a plan. He was going to be a rock star. His first band made a splash in the Seattle grunge scene and showed some real potential, but there was something in Jason that still wanted to blow stuff up, and this time it wasn't the plumbing. It was his future. Jason became difficult to collaborate with and even less fun to be around. His friends and family could do nothing but watch in horror as the promising band eventually had to replace him. But destiny was not quite done with Jason. After some genuine regret and self-reflection, the rock star in waiting was given a second chance. This time, an older band of more established musicians saw Jason's undeniable talent and welcomed him into their midst. Overnight, Jason was playing to sold-out arenas, standing ovations, and glowing reviews from everybody in the industry. But again, 
Jason couldn't seem to handle the success he thought he craved. Maybe he was depressed, or maybe he was just a drag to be around. Whatever the case, Jason retreated into himself once again, sabotaging his future, leaving his bandmates with no choice but to replace the moody bass player with someone less miserable. Sometimes, when you hit what feels like the bottom, it's not enough to simply start over. Sometimes, you got to go in a completely different direction. So Jason did something that most aspiring rock stars would never do. He cut his hair. He lost his nose ring. Then he enlisted in the Army and applied for a fast-track program into Ranger School. Jason not only got in, he excelled. From Fort Benning, Georgia, it was off to Fort Lewis, Washington, not far from where he had blown up the innocent toilet ten years earlier. There he completed his ranger training and got a round-trip ticket to Latin America, where he fought in a number of covert wars. Then it was off to Asia to combat piracy on the high seas. Jason served with great distinction, but he wanted more. So at 26 years of age, old for a soldier, he applied for the Special Forces and got in, completing his final stage of training on September 11, 2001. In no time, he was up to his neck in the world's most dangerous places. In Afghanistan, Jason smelled the poppy fields of Kandahar, came face to face with suicide bombers, and learned the local language. He helicoptered in Iraq, firing grenades from a Humvee in the front line of America's biggest conventional military operation since World War II. Basically, Jason was on the world stage, playing with a very different kind of band, a band of brothers. Again, you won't get any of these details from Jason directly. Most of what he did is still classified. But the medals and the photos covering the wall in the cabin he calls home are both numerous and hard to discount. The coveted combat infantryman badge sits next to a photo of Jason with Donald Rumsfeld and General Stanley McChrystal. You might say that in blowing things up, Jason finally found a career he couldn't destroy. And by hitting the reset button when he did, Jason did something pretty extraordinary. Because while Jason is certainly not the only one to ever sabotage his own career, he might be the only one to do so in such spectacular, incomparable fashion. If you thought Pete Best blew it back with the Beatles, consider this. The first band that Jason bungled sold 30 million records the year after he got himself fired. Yeah, 30 million. And the second band? Don't even get me started on the second band. Ultimately, Jason Everman, the guitar player that everybody wanted, missed out on more than 100 million albums sold and many, many, many millions of dollars. But what he wound up with was a hell of a story. The only guitar player to wash out of two of the greatest bands to ever take the stage, Nirvana and Soundgarden, but still go on to become an American rock star. Anyway, that's the way I heard it.